Welcome to Case of the Week, Septate Uterus. I'm Dr. Dan Colville from Radiologist Headquarters. Let's take a look at the case and then I'll review key learning points at the end. So here we're starting with a hysterosalpingogram in HSG where a catheter is placed into the cervix and then contrast is instilled into the endometrial cavity. This study is mainly done to evaluate for fallopian tube patency, which we do have here. You can see contrast is spilling out into the adnexal regions, but then you also notice an abnormal configuration to the endometrial cavity. Normally this should fill in as a triangle, but we have divergence of the fundal endometrial cavities superiorly. Now traditionally, if you measured this angle here, if it was less than 75 degrees, that would suggest more of a septate uterus, and if the angle was wider, greater than 105 degrees, that would suggest more of a bicornuate uterus. But those numbers have since been found to not be consistently reliable. You really need to evaluate the external uterine contour to differentiate between septate and bicornuate uteri. This patient went on to have an MRI of the pelvis. Here we're looking at a coronal T2-weighted series at the level of the sacroiliac joints. And as I scroll anteriorly, you can see the normal right ovary and the normal left ovary, both containing T2-bright physiologic follicles there. And in the central pelvis, there's the uterus. We can see the T2-bright endometrial cavity with the surrounding T2-dark junctional zone. Notice as I scroll anteriorly, you see again this divergence of the endometrial cavities towards the fundus, but we're not getting a great look at the outer fundal contour because we're looking at it in this plane. Just some landmarks, there's the urinary bladder containing T2 bright urine and then the urethra right there. Now we're looking at the T2 weighted sagittal series. Again, there's an ovary containing T2 bright follicles, which are normal. And as we move closer to the midline, now we're looking at the uterus here. There's the uterine fundus, the uterine body, the lower uterine segment and the cervical region. There's that T2 bright endometrial stripe with the surrounding normal thickness T2 dark junctional zone. There's the collapsed urinary bladder with the urethra immediately posterior to the pubic symphysis. Now this series doesn't really help us, right? It doesn't really tell us as far as what's going on with that uterine fundal contour. But the MRI technologist uses this series to obtain a coronal oblique view in line with the uterus. And let me just show you what that means. So now we can use that T2 sagittal series to obtain the plane of imaging that we need to evaluate that outer fundal contour. So instead of doing a straight axial view, which would be in this plane of imaging, we're kind of doing a coronal oblique of the uterus. So we're obtaining images in plane with the uterus. And look at that nice fundal contour evaluation we get because of this orientation. So this is key to obtain this T2 coronal oblique series when you're evaluating for a Mullerian duct anomaly. All right, now let's look a little more closely at that T2 coronal oblique series of the uterus. So here's the outer fundal contour of the uterus, and notice how it's actually a bit convex. It flattens out a bit, but what we do not see is concavity. We do not see a fundal cleft. And what that would tell us, if we had a fundal cleft, an indentation of the outer fundal contour more than a centimeter, that would be highly specific for either a bicornuate or a didelphic uterus. So the fact that we do not see that tells us we're dealing with either an arcuate or a septate uterus. So how do you differentiate those two? Well, then you look at this myometrial bulge that's impressing upon the endometrial cavities, and the fact that you see this sharp angle here, this acute angle, and the fact that it goes rather deep into the mid to distal uterus, that's more specific for a septate as opposed to an arcuate uterus, which would have more of a broad-based bulge of the fundus. Just some additional landmarks. There's that normal right ovary again and the left ovary. As we move inferiorly, you can follow the endometrial cavity into the cervix where you have a T2 dark stromal ring. Below that, we're seeing an incidental tampon within the collapsed vaginal cavity, and as we move in fairly, there's the empty vaginal cavity there, just anterior to the lower rectum and posterior to the urethra. A great landmark for finding the urethra on either CT or MRI is to first find that pubic symphysis, and it'll be immediately posterior to that region. Another important series to obtain when you're evaluating Mullerian duct anomalies is this large field of view coronal T2 series, which will include the kidneys. And that's important because there's an increased risk of renal anomalies like renal agenesis or duplication in patients who have Mullerian duct anomalies, but we don't see any abnormality here. We do see some trace free fluid in the upper pelvis that's likely physiologic. There are the normal ovaries. Let's look at some key points for a septate uterus, and you can also find these in the episode show notes. So this is the most common Mullerian duct anomaly, about 55%, compared to bicornuate uterus, which only represents 10% of the Mullerian anomalies. And it's an abnormality of septal reabsorption. So you may be wondering, what are the Mullerian ducts anyway? Well, there are these paired embryologic structures that undergo fusion and resorption in utero, and that gives rise to the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the cervix, and the upper two-thirds of the vagina, but not the ovaries or the lower vagina. Now, when you're imaging these anomalies, ultrasound is usually the initial study, ideally using 3D ultrasound with MRI reserved for complex or indeterminate cases. And both of these modalities are great because they give you assessment of the external uterine contour, which is key, and also allows you the opportunity to evaluate for any associated renal anomalies, which can occur. 
HSG is of limited value as it cannot reliably differentiate between these subtypes. And again, that's because you don't get a consistent look at that external fundal contour. You're just seeing the endometrial cavity. With septate uterus, as we saw, the fundus is usually convex. It may be minimally indented, but if there is a fundal cleft, it should be less than one centimeter. More than one centimeter, you should think more biconuit or didelphus. And that fundal cleft measurement has actually been found to be 100% sensitive and specific in differentiating these types of fusion abnormalities. Now, you should always be skeptical when any study tells you that something is 100%, <laughs> but the point is it's extremely accurate as long as you have a nice coronal oblique view of that uterine fundal contour. Now, that midline septum can be a variable length. It may be subseptate and only partially extend across the endometrial cavity, or it may extend all the way to the cervix. It can also be muscular or fibrous, and it's actually important to differentiate the composition if possible, as that may alter the surgical approach. For example, a relatively thin fibrous septum could be treated with a less invasive hysteroscopic septoplasty, but if there's a thick, predominantly muscular septum, that might require a transabdominal surgical approach to adequately resect it. And compared to bicornuit uterus, there's a higher incidence of reproductive complications, namely miscarriage with septate uterus, so it is important to differentiate between the two on imaging. And if a patient does have recurrent fetal loss, that's when resection of the septum might be considered, or even proactively as the patient is undergoing reproductive planning. And this patient actually successfully had the septum resected. Hey, that's it, and thank you for joining me for Septate Uterus. If you enjoyed this lecture, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Until next time, radiology is life.